Every human being has weird thoughts going through their head. Oh, God, it's so embarrassing. I'm afraid I'll never get another job again. That I will die and will have not been special. My brain has the gift of seeing the terrible. A million-pound tourniquet being turned against my chest that was constant. Then I started sabotaging my own career. Wanting to die and... To stop him from feeling any joy. <laughs> that is... Very uncomfortable in my own body. I ended up becoming a male prostitute. And what I became was an animal. They took away my shoelaces. I became chaos. Like it hurts. I just want to go. I just want to leave. You have no idea what a small part of your life this is. If you go to a support group, it's like creating a family that you didn't have. I mean, life is 1% event. My body was abused. 99% judgment about that event. But they couldn't touch the best parts of me. But the world is a little bit wounding. It's also glorious. It does always get better. It really does. I'm here with Juan Medina, who is a, uh, a listener, and uh, you are, are how old again? I'm 26. 26 years old, and you were born in the L.A. area. You now live in Vegas? I was born in Mexico, and I lived uh, in Vegas. Oh, okay. Were, did you spend any part of your life in Southern California? Uh, no. Well, this podcast is over then. Oh, well, <laughs> I'll get going then. <laughs> Why did I think you were – I do remember now that you said that, that you were – uh, you were born in Mexico. Um, I, you know, I have so many emails going with different people at the same time. I apologize. Uh, no, I'm sure it's hard to keep track. Yeah. I almost never get the, I'm talking with such and such. They're from so and so. I almost <laughs> never get it right. I don't know why I don't just have you guys say it. I guess because I, I, I like to run my mouth. But anyway, um, so you were, you were born in Mexico and how did you come to the country? Uh, well, um, my dad, way before he even met my mom, he would come to the States uh, to work. And um, eventually over time, my mom pressured him like, okay, we have to come live with you. Either you stay with us or we come live with you over there because this kind of back and forth is not working out. And what did your dad come to do? What kind of work? Um, He did, uh, from what I know, just um, labor, just, mm -hmm. just, just work as a... As a laborer, uh, I know he he washed windows. He uh, worked in uh, construction and cleanups. Um, he just did odd jobs just to make some money, and then he would uh, send a little bit our way. And um, and was he here on a visa? Was he here illegally? Would he have to come back and forth? At first, um, he, uh, he would come uh, to the states illegally. Mm -hmm. He. Um, I just recently found this out from my mom, which I didn't know. He would actually jump on trains um, that would go from Mexico to the U.S., and he would just sneak on a train, like just hop like a boxcar hobo, just get on, jump on a on a train, and um, make his way to the to uh, California. Wow, um, I, I can't imagine the um, the amount of energy it takes to sneak into another country. It was and then to have to work on top of that. Oh, it's um it is um it is a big headache. It's not it's not like it's it's any it's easier. Like you just have to, you know, kinda kind of wait till no one's looking and then just kinda dash across the line. Like, no, it takes a lot of work. No matter which way you do it, it takes um it takes quite a bit of, uh, bit of work to uh cross to another country. Yeah. Uh where in Mexico did you live? I lived in um uh, a small town in uh, Michoacan uh, called uh, Purandiro. Okay. I'm going to pretend like I know how either of those <laughs> are spelled. How far, for, how far from the border? What was the closest American city Ooh, to you guys? Um, well, uh, Michoacan's not really close to um, to the States. How do you spell Michoacan? Uh, Michoacan is um, M-I-C-H-O-A-C-A-N. Oh, I've seen that word. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's a few restaurants that use that word. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I'm doing that... Mostly for the people that mm -hmm. transcribe the show. Oh, all right. <laughs> um, and and what was the uh, the other? Uh, oh, uh, yeah, Purandiro. Yeah, that's a little tricky. It's a uh, P U R U A N D I R O. Okay. Um, so, what was the closest American city to those, and how 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 many miles was it? Oh, um, we weren't. Uh, it, it's not close to the states at all. It's kind of. Um, um, it's kind of uh, in the southern part of Mexico, oh. kind of where uh, where the country kind of uh, bends at the at the coastline around there. Um, so, 
your dad would then clearly not go back all the way to southern Mexico when he would come across. Was there a place in, in Me- or or did he? Well, what he would do is he would um, he had some friends, and they would travel. Um, they would travel, you know, up north uh, near the border, and he, then from there they would uh, get on a hop on a train and and uh, get across to the states. So he would have a, a place to stay near the border. I don't think he had a, a, a place to stay. He just kind of um, he he would get a ride, and once he got there, I think he may, he maybe stay in a hotel if he needed to at a, at a motel. Okay. And so he just waited for the train to come. And was his goal to eventually settle in the United States, or to just keep making money and keep your family afloat and stay where you were in southern Mexico? Um, I think his goal was kind of to pretend he was uh, single with no family. He um he, um he did kind of well. My grandfather did as well. He would uh, he would work in the states, um, uh, send money back to the family, and um, he would send back, uh, money back to the family, um, and maybe um, for a month or so stay and then spend the rest of the time uh, in the states. And. For for what purpose to to lead the life of a of a single man with no strings attached, or did it make it easier for for him to keep a low profile by pretending he was single with no family? Um. Uh, what uh, my mom thinks is that he just kind of um, if you could um, if he could uh, it was his only cha- kind of way to kind of like pretend he was single with no kids for a while is um, you know he would work in another country, send us money, and he would uh, visit us. Um, very few days. Um, I have um, a brother and two sisters, and, um, and one of your sisters is, is um, here. Yes, and she's actually the uh, the only one that was born in the states. Uh, the rest of us were born in Mexico, and he was not there for uh, any of our births. Um, so he was he was kind of uh, he was kind of absent a lot. Um, I remember um, when I was uh, a little kid, and my mom would uh, would tell me too that. When he would he would come, I didn't know he was my, my dad. He would uh, show up at the door, and I would just uh, tell my mom, oh, "Mom, my uncle's here." Mm. And because uh, he, you know, he just he just wasn't around a lot, um, just very very rarely, like just for a few days. So, how did you then come to? And are, are your parents still together or no? I uh, know they're not. Okay. They got divorced probably five years ago. Okay. Um, so, how did? And, and did you feel like your your dad was living another life here in the in the states that he was hiding from you guys, or did you not know? Or um, my mom uh, kind of felt he doesn't have another family, but my mom kind of felt that he was just kind of um, kind of a uh, postponing his fatherly duties as much as he could, and just by saying, "Oh, you know what? I'm going to work in the states and send you guys money." Mm-hmm. And um, that'll be the end of my responsibility. Yeah, pretty much. Until my mom finally pressured, I'm like, "No, this isn't. This isn't working out. You, you know, you have to either uh, work here and be with your family, or we move uh, to the states with you." And so uh, he said, "Okay, come to the states." Um, um, my mom probably wouldn't say it, it was that simple. That's like, "Oh, sure, why not?" But after 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 um, being pestered a lot, um, um, yeah, we moved to uh, um, to Vegas and. How old were you when that happened? I was around eight years old. And what do you remember of that? I remember, I remember a lot of, a lot of trips to um, Mexico City, trying to get everything, um, um, get everything settled so I can come, uh, so we could all come here legally. Um, my father and 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 from what I understand, mm-hmm. it's not easy to to come here legally because there's a cap on yes. how many people can can move here and was that difficult was it just luck that you guys were able to we um we lucked out because if um if your parents um are citizens um or were citizens of the United States they uh they're actually more lenient on you and it just so happened that um my dad's dad and my mom's dad were at one point U.S. citizens. Oh, really? Yeah, they came. Um, 
they came to the States legally, they became citizens to work, and they didn't like it, and they went back to Mexico. Okay. Do you know why they didn't like it? Um, what, um, what a lot of people don't understand is that whilst a lot of Mexicans um, supposedly you know, um, go to the U.S. for a better life, a lot of them prefer, uh, prefer um, Mexico because, well, they're adults. They live their whole lives there. You know, if you come here in your 30s and 40s, you might not like it. You might like the culture you grew up with better. Some people do like it. My mom loves it here. But some people, you know, I, I, know, uh, I know of a lot of people that, uh, that eventually they just move back because yeah, they're just like, oh, you know what? Um, uh, I just want to go back home. It's uh, simpler, uh, simpler living, and um, and uh, I know. Or with a, with a few guys, they're just like, yeah, my my wife's not liking it, so we're heading back. Mm -hmm. I would imagine if you move here at at a you know when you're middle aged, it, it's probably hard to um, not feel like a visitor uh, because you've got all that it's, all that stuff you're used to back back home. It is a culture shock, and uh, not knowing uh, the language doesn't help either. Um, I picked it up pretty pretty fast because I was eight years old. Within a year and a half, I was able to um, to speak uh, English and communicate better. But uh, my mom you has have, been. And you have no accent. I don't. I don't oh, hear any. Thank you. Any accent? It'll come out. If, uh, yeah. if, I, if I'm nervous, all of a sudden uh, it'll come out. I've actually had um, for uh, for the listeners um, uh, like uh, we're talking about. I'm Mexican, but I look pretty much white. I, um, I have blonde hair and like bluish green eyes, and I just confuse people when I tell them my name is Juan. They just look look yeah. at me funny. Yeah. If I go to a to a restaurant and they ask for your name for a table or for your food, and you know, they uh, when they ask for my name, you know, I tell them Juan. And they're like, excuse me. <laughs> uh, it's Juan. Juan, you say? Yes, Juan. I know. I know. Um, and sometimes I just say John, just so just so, so yeah. I can avoid saying my name three or four times. Yeah. But. Um, yeah, and um, since I've been here 18 years, my mom has picked up enough English um, so she can communicate at work. But, you know, she's, it's still broken. It's still broken because it's uh, – when you're older – she came here in her 30s. When you're older, it's just – it takes a lot of work to actually pick up a second language. As a little kid, like, I just wanted to watch cartoons, so I had to learn the language. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you remember uh – about moving here when when you were eight, I would imagine there's a, a, a fairly sizable a Latino population in Vegas. So it yes. wouldn't have been like moving to St. Paul, Minnesota. <laughs> no, no, uh, yeah. Um, I uh, halfway uh, I started halfway my second grade here, and it was um, they 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 do have a program in um, the Clark County School District where I went and elementary school where they have a. Um, uh, the students are divided into, uh, you know, um, first to fifth grade into like six different tracks, and one track was English as a second language, and um, and that one they stuck, uh, they would uh, st uh, stick kids in there that are, are foreign, that uh, uh, it's uh, they're struggling to learn uh, English or they just moved, and uh, from there, um, they uh, they learn, they don't really. They're not classes in Spanish, but that's where they they just put them together. I see. And um, I I would think they just went over things uh, more slowly until kids picked up the language, and then um, it took me about by the end of, uh, by the probably third grade they moved me out of that English as a second language that track. Feel great. Oh, I was I was pretty proud of myself. I'm like, oh, all right, I'm going to I'm going with the white kids. You should feel you should feel <laughs> great. I mean, that's a. That's an accomplishment. I suppose it also, not to minimize your accomplishment, but kids are such sponges. Um, oh, you know, absolutely. that's a testament too. That's that's what just makes it easier. Yeah, because as a, as a little kid, you just pick up everything. It's it's um, it's a lot simpler to learn a second language when your brain is still developing. Mm -hmm. So just coming here, being dropped off in another language, going just going to another school, where. Um, and everything was still in English, you know, the, from work to uh, what the teacher spoke. Everything was still in Eng English, so eventually you just you pick it up slowly. I remember still in fourth grade. I'm just like, ah, oh, I'm not really quite sure how to say this, but I can still get by. Mm -hmm. And at, at what age did did you become a legal citizen? I became a uh, 
a citizen around middle school. I would think it was um, seventh grade because we got we got our green card and you know uh, residency all all straight now to uh, to live in the states. And I was in middle school, and my mom uh, told me, "It's like, hey, by the way, um, you're now a citizen of the United States." And I'm like, "What? Wait, what? What was I before?" <laughs> I just didn't understand. I'm like, what? Was I not allowed to be here before? Was I a house guest yeah. of America? Uh, what What was it like being... I would imagine you you were able to hear white people's racism because they thought you weren't Hispanic. So you were probably privy to some racist conversations. Absolutely. Yeah, um, even today, I'm... I work as a maintenance engineer in a, in a hotel in Vegas, and all my coworkers, it's a union job, and all my coworkers are pretty much um, um, 30s to, you know, guys in their 30s from their 60s, um, white males. And because I don't look Mexican, sometimes some racist things come out of their mouth, and and they just kind of forget that I'm Mexican and they'll just kind of look at me like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. I'm like, um, sure you are. Um, I've heard you drop the end bomb multiple times, but I'm sure you're joking about Mexicans. <laughs> does it, does it bother you? It does. Um, it does bother me. Um, not to the point where I can't work with these guys, but inside it just, it does bug me. What does it feel like? Um, it just, it it hurts because uh, as pr- as proud as I am of uh, of my uh, Mexican heritage, I do feel American. I've been here since um, since I was eight years old, so I do feel American um, when um, when things aren't um, when things aren't going well in this country, you know. I get upset because I want them to because I do want this country to be better than it is. Um, So hearing and hearing somebody say something about where I was born, it just doesn't, it just, it just hurts. I'm just, it, you know, you just, you just get angry for, you know, like my own. um, Do you you feel like, um, describe if you can, what it feels like in your in your body is it like a flush feeling in your face where you're you feel humiliated or is it like a rage that you want to punch him it is it is a mixture of um of humiliation and um and rage and just kind of you know if i i hear a coworker say something i'm just just keep my head down and just just i just shake my head and just and, and try not to say anything and eventually they real they kind of remember oh yeah oh well, who wants here and they kind of just look at me to see, like, oh, I'm, am I okay? I'm just, I just ignore them. I just ignore them. Then, um, what would you like to say to them sometimes? Um, that it doesn't matter what country you're from. If you're a good person, you're a good person, and you're an asshole for thinking less of a whole group of people that you don't know. Um. I think um, it's um, uh, Latinos and um, and Black people have have a, a, this problem in this country where they're generalized. They, uh, people build stereotypes about um, Black and um, and Hispanics, and white people don't get that for some reason. I would disagree with you because I have run across uh, I not to the degree mm-hmm. I think that that you guys experience it and and certainly um you know because we are the ruling class whatever you want to call it um but I have come across um people who if if they're not racist towards white people they will tell me oh my my mother told me don't ever be a fr- friends with a white person you can't trust the white man you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and um, that bothers me, mm-hmm. and, and I'm not in any way comparing my quote-unquote <laughs> struggle to your struggle. But I, I take exception to the idea that there that there isn't um, reverse racism. But uh, ours 
is certainly not a struggle. It's more of a a novelty. Right. No, though, there's a, there's racism no matter what you're, where you're from, what you like there look like there's always racism. But uh there's certain stereotypes that like I could have, you know, I could have a conversation with somebody and just to be about race or just they, they can just ask me like something like like wow, why are you um oh, why do um Mexicans have a uh, have kids in their teens? I'm just and I'm like I don't know how to <laughs> how to answer that because I'm Mexican, I'm 26 and with no kids. So, I don't know how what this this generalization comes from that, you know, all Mexicans have kids young and I'm I'm standing here like it would be like you asking me, why do you love slaves so much? <laughs> <laughs> what was it with you guys and slaves? I'm yeah. just, I don't get yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I think, I think there's something in our DNA that allowed us to survive by making broad generalizations. Mm -hmm. But in many ways, it's not serving us anymore because, you know, I find myself thinking racist thoughts sometimes, um, um, you know, judging something prior to investigating it. Um, and and it makes me feel a little bit uh, a little bit ashamed. But I think how how do you get raised in our in our society and not have some of the those things affect you when when you know when I was a kid growing up in the seventies I I never saw an example of a of a black professional. Um, it was they played the pimp right. or they played. Uh, you know the street person mm -hmm. or the maid and it was when I started working for an insurance company in my late teens early 20s um, I was the sole white person in a pool of like 30 black women mm -hmm. and that was the best education I ever got right. because we became friends they began to take me to their places I went to eat soul food with them and um you know, drove through the projects with them, and and it was, um, I felt I don't know if I've ever felt so accepted and so um, I don't know when somebody when somebody takes you in and shows you their culture. I think that's like one of the most loving vulnerable things that that somebody can do for you and I, I i'll never forget that but i who i was before i met them was a vastly different person than who i was after i met them and i think so much racism could be changed just by simply hanging out <laughs> with each other that's something that's uh, i think it's a problem in this country is um is uh empathy um you know not to get um um political or anything um there was um that congressman that uh you know uh, he was uh, against gay marriage but as his son came out as being gay and you know he started to see things from a different point of view and you know he changed his opinion on that do you think that is because somebody has an inherent hostility in them or is it their inability to picture themselves in someone else's shoe or shoes or the shoe in case the person has one foot <laughs> um or is it that they they don't want to try to put themselves in someone else's shoes and picture what their life is like? I think a lot of people are struggling with their own lives, so putting themselves in someone else's shoe is just um, it's just too much work because they're they're struggling they're struggling um, in their own life with you know just getting by. So actually um, worrying about other people's struggles is not really an option. And um, and for the most part, um, politicians just kind of feed on that instead of actually making things better. Oh, I agree. I definitely agree. It's 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 a much easier way to campaign um, by embracing people's fear mm -hmm. and broad generalizations. Oh yeah. Uh, than than it is to offer actual solutions exactly. that might involve a, a, a special interest group not getting its money. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So let's talk about mental issues that, that you've struggled with in your life. What When was the first mental issue that, that you began to feel like, something's not right with me? Um, 
I've uh, actually discovered a lot of things um, uh, pretty recently about myself um, that I just didn't know. But it um, um, a lot of the a lot of the issues that I had to deal with all started when uh, we moved here to the states. When we moved in with my dad. Um, um, from from a little kid, I was uh, I was really scared of him. Even though I didn't see him much, I don't have that many memories of him from when uh, when I lived in Mexico. Um, there's just a few memories where you know just seeing him drunk, and um, just um, throwing up in the garden. The fucking Mexicans. <laughs> <laughs> they got this an awful beer. <laughs> And um, just being, you know, like four years old and seeing, you know, this this guy that, you know, just, you you know, you're just, you're just learning that he's your father and just violently throwing up and just like being sick. First time I saw that, I, I was like, is he going to be OK? Is he is he dying right here? I have no idea what's going on. So there, I've never seen that. So there was a volatility to your dad. That, yes. That was made it hard to feel vulnerable from from, from the start. It was just being um, being scared of him. And um, it's something. It's something that the whole family uh, pretty much felt when uh, when we all lived in together. That's when uh, we all moved to Vegas and lived together, and just in a small like, three bedroom apartment. We that's when um, things got worse because we actually got to spend you know mm-hmm. more time with them. Yeah. Uh, how often was his drinking out of control or clearly a problem or an issue? Um, when uh, I was younger. Um, it was a, a much bigger problem when I was, uh, let's say, um, elementary school to middle school. He, he quit drinking. Uh, I don't really think he was an alcoholic because I don't think he drinks today. He just couldn't handle his alcohol, and it brought out his rage. And there was multiple times where we would go to a, a, a family or a friend's um, a birthday party, and I could recall multiple times where he was just, you know, way too drunk to be driving. And but there we were all in the car just crying and um, just scared because he you know he was just driving drunk on the wrong side of the lane. And oh just, my God! Yeah, it was you know that was uh, that was terrifying as a kid. Wow, that uh, the loss of control must have been so profound. That feeling of this my my life is in this person's hands. Absolutely, absolutely. You know he's. Um, your father is supposed to be is supposed to be kind of a strong male role model and you know we never I never really saw that you know as a kid would you talk to each other about him or did everybody just kind of keep it to themselves um we would we would talk we would talk to each other I would talk to uh, um to my sister who's probably a year and a half younger than me and um we would talk. Is it the sister that's here? No, no, no. She's uh, okay. she's uh, she's eighteen. And what is the sister's name again? Uh, Yvonne. Yvonne. And Yvonne is eighteen. Eighteen. Yes. Okay. And how old is your old your other sister? 20, uh, my other 24? sister is twenty four, and I have a brother that's twenty. Okay. And Yvonne, if at some point you you want to chime in on anything, uh, you're welcome to uh, to come over and <laughs> shake your head. No, <laughs> she's okay. I just want you to know that that's you know that's open to you if you if you choose to. Thanks. Um, so you would, what would you say to each other? You know, oh, we were just scared. It's my, uh, my, my childhood. I, all I remember is I have, I blocked a lot out just because, you know, just your brain protects you from any traumatic experiences and just decides, you know, we're, we're going to kind of move this to the side and forget about it. Um, we're going to open that when we're 38. Yeah. We're going to open this later and yeah. just, um, we're not, you know what, for 10 years, you're not going to be sure if this was a dream. Eventually, mm-hmm. you're going to find out it wasn't, and then uh, it's gonna, all hell's going to break loose. But when um, – I just remember living in fear when I was a kid because as soon as we heard um, the key going to the door or uh, my, dad's, uh, my dad's truck pulling up in front of the house, it's just, oh, God, he's here. Um Oh, I'm just gonna go in my room, or um, where can where can I go? That you know, where can I where can I be out of sight? Pretty much, mm-hmm. that was pretty much uh, my child, whole childhood and the whole time I lived 
Um, I lived in a house with them. I was like, oh, man, he's here. There was never like, oh, dad's home. It was, oh, God, I hope he doesn't uh, hope he doesn't start yelling at my mom today. I hope I don't get singled out. Yeah. Oh. Um, would he, was he violent towards you guys? Um, I don't know. Um, Yvonne might remember more. I don't remember him being, um, there were some, uh, you know, corporal punishments. Um, I don't remember not too much coming from my dad. It's more, more just, uh, more emotional, psychological, and just, um, just living in fear is just will mess you up in your own house. Um, when you said I don't remember coming from my dad, would it come from someone else? N- um, no. Okay. Um, I remember. I remember when I was uh, I was in first grade in uh, in Mexico. Um, a kid in my class had a had a Super Nintendo, so I went to his house because he had a freaking Super Nintendo and Street Fighter Two, so I wanted to play, and. Um, I did it a couple of times where I just went straight up to school to his house and just played, stayed there for way too long, and then went home, and my mom was just worried sick, and um, and uh, she uh, she uh, uh, beat me with a rope just because oh, she was just angry that, you know, I, I was stressing her out and all that, and, um, and not too long ago, we were uh, having a discussion about, um, um, you know, hitting kids and how that's not exactly... A, Discipline. People just think, um, yeah, there's a lot of kind of self entitled and bratty kids, but just hitting them is not what <laughs> what makes right. a, what makes uh, a kid grow up to be a good person. It's you know it's good parenting, and, cons- and, and consequences are great oh, great for kids. Well, consequences but- are great. You know, I don't I don't think a backhand is a uh, you know the best con- the best you know punishment for a, for a young mind. And it and it sends such a weird message to kids when it's I was worried about you. I'm going to let you know how worried I was by hurting you physically. Oh, yeah. It's such a weird mixed message. It's you know it's it's it doesn't make sense at all. It's, but um um not, not too long ago, you know, I uh I brought it up to her and she's like, "Man, geez, you know, like that, like I know much about parenting. I'm 26 with no kids, mm-hmm. but I'm, you know, I'm just, uh, you know, I, don't, I think, you know, hitting kids does more harm than good. And um, I told her, I was like, wait, if you take, um, if you want to take your your new dog and you want to train him, and so he can be a uh, obedient and a well behaved dog, you go to a trainer. The first thing he doesn't do is here's a roll of newspaper. If uh, he doesn't do what you want, you just hit him with it. There's no good trainer that does that. It's, you know, kind of positive reinforcement and um, all kinds of tricks that don't evolve hitting the dog at all. Mm-hmm. And I told my mama that um, that hitting is not good enough for a dog. Why would it be good enough for a kid? And my, my mom's, um, my mom's, she's, she's, uh, she's, a, she's a great person. And she didn't, she didn't kind of like try to defend like well, you know what? I've hit my kids, and you know sometimes you no. She didn't try to defend her past um, past decisions at all. She was like, "You're right, you know, um, hitting hitting your kids is not it's not right." And it felt good for her, for her to say that, just because I had to feel amazing. Oh, you're like, you know, wow, you know that it, cause it's so rare for just any adult to just admit, you know, they made you know a simple mistake over nothing, but about a ch- a mistake with your children, that's that takes you know that takes a lot of bravery. Yeah, you know, as you share that, I'm thinking to myself, when when parents hit their kids to let their anger out because they were afraid the kid was lost mm-hmm. or something like that, you know, I remember my my mom wouldn't uh, wouldn't hit me, but she would like rage at me mm-hmm. because she was worried, and I just remember th- thinking, I feel like an object that you treasure, and you're not addressing who I am inside, it's more like what my presence means to your life, like I'm an important thing to you right. that you were afraid that you lost. And it, when your mom apologized to you, it, it it's so touching to me because it feels like that's the part of you that you want your parent to see as a kid, your humanity, your the soft part of you. Absolutely. That, that you're that your parent is supposed to protect. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it, it meant a lot just for here, for uh, for uh, for me to hear her say that, that just, you know what, um, 
that's something I shouldn't have done, and um, maybe there's something uh, I should have done in another way. But I just, you know, she didn't know how to handle it at that mm-hmm. moment. And that's that's actually that's actually like a memory, just like kind of like, oh wow, I really liked video games as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have any like any memories that stand out of my father hitting me, but that's the one that um, just like my father's. Um, um, kind of like um, uh, psychological torture. That's what that's what that's what affected me the most. And before we get to that, mm-hmm. I just want to interject too that we I think we also have a responsibility once we're adults to say, okay, this happened to me. Mm-hmm. I have to accept that it's a part of my reality. How am I going to move forward? Absolutely. And ideally, we get to a place where we can have compassion because our parents didn't have the tools to cope with their overwhelming feelings. And, and maybe we even get to a place where, where we forgive them and accept them as they are. Easier said than done. Um, Absolutely. Um, and I've heard you mention on the, on the podcast before, I don't want this to be a, a blame, uh, blame my parents kind of thing um, because it's, that doesn't really do anything for you. Um, um, you just the you kind of deal with what has happened and um you learn to you learn to forgive people yeah you know hopefully we we reexamine our childhoods not to make our parents suffer but to process the feelings we've been running from our whole lives so we can stop suffering absolutely um resentment's not going to make me feel like a like a new person you know, it's, that's not gonna that's not gonna help me. Even though that's a phase of what you right. have to go through and process. Oh, absolutely. There, you know, there's um, anger and resentment. You kind of go through those phases before you kind of like you get past that and just okay, how am I gonna how am I gonna overcome it? Mm-hmm. So, what was some of the psychological torture that uh, your dad would inflict? Well, is um, he's um, he has a very loud an intimidating voice which I've recently found out I have too that he, he's just one of those people that you know you see some of those people that just when they get angry you don't really you're just like oh well, that person's angry and when you see somebody else that looks out of control when they're angry just oh my god what's he gonna do mm-hmm. that's the kind of angry he was and just um, I think he didn't quite know how to deal with you know, having a family and, you know, supporting, you know, everybody. But he would, uh, you know, he, w- he would get into such, you know, sh- screaming matches. Uh, well, w- w- it wasn't a screaming match because my mom wasn't really screaming at him. Mm-hmm. You know, she, she she doesn't have that loud a voice. And, you know, eventually it would just end up with her with her crying. And uh, some of those altercations some, sometimes um, became physical. So you just, as a little kid, and when you hear that, and he would hit your mom. Yeah, yeah. He um, he uh, he spent uh, a night in jail because uh, my mom called the the cops on him. Um, I don't um, know exactly 